This is what the Earth looked like 150 million years ago, right as it was experiencing a period of severely hot temperatures, one that led to the death of nearly a third of all life residing on it, and opened the door for one kind of animal to grow larger than ever before. Dinosaurs. I think it's safe to say Earth during the Jurassic was a dynamic place, which is probably why all of you watching are familiar with it, as the changes that took place here at this time continue to affect the distribution of life on this planet. To better understand the changes happening here on this Jurassic Earth and why they had such long-lasting implications, all we need to do is travel back in time and take a look at its surface, where the story of how geography started the Jurassic is spelled out for us clearly. Okay, hang on, in order for any of this to make sense, first we need to know a little bit about the time period directly before the Jurassic, the Triassic. This was when all of the Earth's major conglomerates of dirt were smushed together into what we today call Pangaea, allowing animals from all corners of the world to explore and seek out any and all environments they might thrive in, which ended up producing a rich array of Triassic animal life everywhere across the landmass. Because of this, the formation of Pangaea can sort of be seen as the defining event of the Triassic, the mechanism that best describes all the various evolutionary trends and extinctions that took place during this time. Naturally, along with all these new interactions came an insane amount of competition, meaning the only way to survive in the Pangaeic arena was to either grow bigger, faster, stronger, or yes, smarter than ever before. Like this, we can see Pangaea was essentially one big evolutionary fight pit where only the fittest escaped extinction. It would appear the fittest by this time was a broad group of reptiles called the Archosaurs, as they had already branched out into Phytosaurs, Drepanosaurs, Aedosaurs, Pterosaurs, Trilophosaurus, Tanistrophius, Ornithosuchus, Rosutia, Crocodilomorpha, and yes, early dinosaurs. These all competed against each other, as well as very similar animals like Temnospondyls, the precursor to modern day amphibians, as well as numerous Lepidosaurs, which would go on to become all lizards. And yes, there were even some large Therapsids, the primitive ancestors of mammals, though by this time we still very much resembled our reptilian cousins. Like this, we can see how dinosaurs were only one of many competing groups during the Triassic, and together with the rest of these formed a complex animal community, without any group really being considered dominant. However, just as fast as tectonics had brought the continents together, so too did forces from deep beneath the crust begin to tear the landmass apart. The first major break came as the result of a rift forming between the Americas and Afro-Eurasia, forming a series of wide valleys where the continental crust was crumbling away. This is what would eventually become the Atlantic Ocean, though by the Jurassic it had only grown to be a large inland sea. Further south, you'd be able to see more evidence for this in the many narrow lakes that come to fill these rift valleys between America and Africa, revealing these two lands in the process of breaking apart. Lining these tectonically active zones would have been a number of massive volcanoes, similar to those found in the Great African Rift Valley of today, except many times more powerful and more numerous. From these volcanoes, huge amounts of fresh lava would have spilled out over the Earth, forming large igneous provinces across what's now four separate continents. While these rocks might be some of the last evidence of these eruptions still around today, at the time of their creation, evidence for their occurrence would have been felt all across the Earth. In the short term, ash sent into the high altitudes reflected more sunlight, reducing global temperatures and causing the planet to plummet into a volcanic winter. Depending on the scale of the eruption, this ash could take anywhere from years to decades to centuries to fully settle out, but once it did, eventually the planet would return to a state similar to that of before. 
If ash was the only thing that came out of volcanoes, that would be the end of the story, but I'm sure everyone watching already knows that another byproduct of volcanism is carbon dioxide, which doesn't just fall out of the air like ash does. After a few million years of these eruptions, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere more than doubled, generating a powerful greenhouse effect that drove global temperatures way up and kept them there even after the volcanism subsided. As a result, deserts expanded all over the planet, especially around the equator, which became virtually inhospitable, turning the bulk of South America and Africa into the biggest expanse of sand and rock this world's ever seen. In turn, this complete and utter irradiation of the tropics forced any animals hoping to survive this heat wave to flee to the cooler, temperate latitudes. Animals trying to move north would have been forced to go through North America, where they'd eventually find forests covering what's now Europe and Asia. This is also where and when pine trees first arose, finding great success in the humid but temperate zone. If animals tried to escape the expanding deserts by migrating south, they'd also find temperate lands, spanning Patagonia, South Africa, India, Australia, oh yeah, and even Antarctica, or maybe what could be referred to as the Antarctic Archipelago. This area would have served as the second great refuge for life on Earth during these hard times, and like this we can see that even before these lands were fully separated by water, the flora and fauna of Laurasia and Gondwana had already become effectively isolated from one another thanks to the Earth's changing climate. Naturally, the cold shock of volcanic winters paired with rising global temperatures amounted to what an ecologist would describe as a disturbance. In college, I learned these happen whenever something like a storm or drought or fire occur and alter the environment. Normally, an ecosystem can recover from an event like this and even create new opportunities where there previously wasn't. But if a fire burns down the same forest year after year after year, even the most resilient trees will eventually stop growing back, and the area will lose all the biodiversity that it harbored. Like this, we can see that while some disturbances can make ecosystems even richer, extreme or repeated disturbances can quickly lead to widespread extinctions, which is exactly what these eruptions were. For starters, the volcanic winters would have placed essentially every plant on Earth suddenly outside of their acceptable growing conditions, likely causing a global collapse in vegetation. Without reliable sources of food, many of the animals that grown larger during the Triassic could no longer eat enough to support their bodies, causing them to disappear for good. One by one, the Temnospondyls, the Lepidosaurs, even large Therapsids died out, along with Phytosaurs, Drepanosaurs, Aetosaurs, Trilophosaurs, Tanistrophius, Ornithosuchus, Rusutia, all incapable of adapting to the changing Earth, leaving only Dinosaurs, Pterosaurs, and Crocodilomorphs, one for the land, one for the air, and one for the water. While each individual eruption likely only drove a handful of species to their extinction, if you consider the hundreds of thousands of eruptions that took place over this time, this should give you an idea of how many species could have been lost. Why exactly it was the dinosaurs that survived this, nobody knows. Perhaps their cold-blooded cousins couldn't stay warm during the volcanic winters. Maybe their feathers helped keep them warm. Maybe they ate plants that were less affected by all this. Again, nobody really knows. But whatever it was, by virtue of the fact that they survived, this tells us that dinosaurs were the best suited, or I guess least vulnerable, to the changes these eruptions brought about, allowing an almost complete turnover of the terrestrial animal community. Though their effects reached even further than this, and in fact it was the Jurassic Ocean where this volcanism was felt the most, as not only did temperatures of the environment change, but so too did its very chemistry. You see, another gas released by these eruptions was sulfur dioxide, which when introduced into the atmosphere readily dissolves into water droplets, producing sulfuric acid, which then entered the ocean as acid rain. 
Over just a few million years, ocean pH dropped sharply, which is really important because acids like to dissolve things like calcium carbonate, the material most sea life used to construct their shells with. More acidic waters means shells literally dissolved faster, and so from the animal's perspective, building and maintaining a shell suddenly required more energy. Together, these rapid fluctuations in temperature and acidity help to explain why corals seemingly disappear from the fossil record at this time. Besides being incredibly sensitive to changes in their environment, corals also, as we learned from the last video, serve as the foundation for countless marine ecosystems. And so, as the coral reefs disappeared, so too did the many creatures that would have called them home. Altogether, about a third of all life on Earth perished as a direct result of these eruptions, affecting virtually every environment on land and in the ocean, earning this event the title the Triassic-Jurassic Extinction. Like this, we can see how the breakup of Pangaea is directly responsible for ending the climatic conditions of the Triassic, which led to a mass extinction that ushered in the age of the dinosaurs. That's how geography started the Jurassic. Though I guess this video also could have been called How Geography Ended the Triassic, but I don't think that would have gotten as many views. And that just goes to show how impactful the Jurassic was, considering everyone watching has at least heard of it. Though to understand what really made this such a revolutionary time in the Earth's history, now we need to follow these changes that took place during the Jurassic to see how they played out. Although Pangaea continues to break apart to this day, by 150 million years ago the surge in volcanism died down, and the planet managed to find a new equilibrium. What would follow would be around 100 million years of relatively stable climatic conditions, marking the end of the Triassic and the beginning of the Cretaceous period. By this time, the ruling reptiles had all but disappeared, paving the way for dinosaurs to replace them, and in the process undergo an insane degree of adaptive radiation. This time of stability is when most popular dinosaurs evolved, each one to fill a niche left vacant, and together established an animal community perhaps equally as rich as the Triassic, but now dominated by a single reptile group. But as these animals continued to evolve, the separate gene pools of Laurasia and Gondwana grew further and further apart, both literally and biologically, leading to two distinct groups of dinosaurs coming to dominate these places, something I go into more depth on in my Biogeography of the Dinosaurs video. Like this, we'll see the Jurassic was really only a transitional period, a time of changing climates, changing environments that in turn changed the very makeup of animals that walk its surface, all caused by a change in geography. If you're curious about how I put this whole story together, you should check out the sponsor of today's video, World Anvil. Here you'll find every tool you could ever need to help organize, write, present, and even publish stories about worlds of your creation, or if you're like me, past versions of the Earth itself. They reached out to me just as I was starting to do research for this video, and I thought it would be the perfect fit because a lot of the tools they offer to writers also helped me build an accurate profile of this planet during this time. I quickly found researching the conditions of the Jurassic Earth, understanding its many inhabitants, and then visualizing everything through maps to be a pretty similar process to world building, and World Anvil had a tool for each job. If they can make it easy for me to assemble the details of this planet from 200 million years ago, they can definitely make it easier for you to organize your thoughts into one cohesive project. And I know this is something you could all use because one of the most popular comments I get are from you all telling me how much watching my videos has helped you with your writing and world building endeavors. And now I can finally direct you to a place that'll help you develop your ideas even further. So if you've been applying what you've learned from my channel into a story, a game, or world of your own, and you're interested in taking your writing to the next level, make sure to use the link in the description to head on over to World Anvil and use the code ATLASPRO when signing up to get 40% off a yearly subscription. By doing this, not only will you be gaining access to a huge array of storytelling tools, but you'll also be helping to support this channel in the process. 
As always, thank you all for watching until the very end. I know I haven't been very active this past month or so, but now that I'm fully moved into my house, this is going to change, and I have a lot of great videos planned for this year, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on what's coming. I'd also like to thank all my patrons for their patience and continued support, especially as I was moving into my new place and couldn't work as usual. They all make what I do possible, so if you like what I do here and would like to continue seeing videos like this, there's a link on screen that'll take you over to my Patreon. Other than that, like the video and I'll see you very soon with another one. Thanks.